Life is very short. He says, you could leave life right now. Let that determine what you do and say and think. And if Marcus Aurelius needed to remind himself of that in the midst of the Antonine Plague, uh, the idea that we wouldn't need to in our much softer, more protected bubble of a world, we need that reminder much more so. I was thinking we should start because I know you did this new book uh, partly for your daughter Mm -hmm. and thinking about how the value of stoicism when you're young is really interesting to me because the more I think about Marcus Aurelius's childhood, the more fascinated I am by it. I was thinking about this the other day. So if you lay out Marcus Aurelius's childhood and Nero's childhood side by side, yeah. they're actually very similar, right? Um, uh-huh. they, they both lose their father very young. They're not uh-huh. actually in line for the throne. And they're introduced to, Sto- uh, to, to Stoicism more or less in their, wow. in their sort of uh, late teens by a great yeah. Stoic teacher, Rusticus for Marcus, uh, Seneca for, for Nero. Um, uh-huh. They both become emperor, and yet it goes very differently for each one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Do you know, honestly, I've never even thought about that before, but you're absolutely right. And um, why is that? Gosh, I don't, do you know, well, controversial, like maybe Seneca <laughs> <laughs> isn't, like, wasn't as good a role model in some ways as, uh, as Junius Rusticus, perhaps. You know, like that, that, it has to be said. Um, sure. You know, maybe Seneca, um, you know, wasn't as, uh, didn't stick to stoic principles as much as, as someone else might have. Um, I see, you know, we, do, we can't know for sure, but I think Seneca kind of collaborated with Nero to some extent. Um, and certainly I don't think Seneca was very popular with the Stoic opposition. I think they saw him like as a, as a bit of a traitor, perhaps. So that could be part of it. Also, what's interesting is Marcus mentions Nero. And, yes. uh, you know, he, he kind of uses him as an example of a degenerate and a tyrant, basically. And also another weird bit of trivia for you is the... Lucius Verus, if I remember rightly, had the same birthday as Nero. Ooh. Yeah. Like, and so people, that, but what that tells us is that Romans would inevitably have thought that there was some kind of comparison between them. The historians think it's worth mentioning that, you know, but they didn't think he was as bad as Nero. Um, but they were both kind of wanted to be celebrities in a way. They were kind of preoccupied with their appearance well, I think what one it, it one potential difference long before Seneca is the mother. Marcus writes quite beautifully yeah. about his mother at the beginning of Meditations. Here, actually, let me grab it because it might be, people might like it. He says he says some very beautiful things about his mother. We should we should riff on this here. Let me grab it. Uh, mm-hmm. This is Gregory Hayes. He says, my mother, her reverence for the divine, her generosity, her inability not only to do wrong, but to even conceive of doing it and the simple way she lived, not in the least like the rich. I don't think Nero would have written that about his mother. Yeah, I mean, I, maybe not in the least like Agrippina. Um, yes. You know, perhaps. Like, she was, Marcus's mother was an intro. I wish we knew more about her. But from the little that we know, she seems to have had a big influence on him. And she, she seems to have been a, a really interesting woman. She grew up in the same household his, as Herodes Atticus, who is the preeminent sophist of the, the period, which is kind of intriguing because she was obviously, to some extent, um, a Hellenophile. Like, she, she wrote in Greek and must have been pretty well acquainted with Greek literature and was fre- and, and knew, although actually we don't know whether she really got on with Herodes Atticus, because like, a lot of people found him quite a dislikable guy. Um, but there's a weird connection. The, the more you study Marcus's life, the more interesting the meditation becomes because, you know, that suddenly this all the scenery starts appearing around him, you yeah. know, and this constellation of people that, that you know, uh, allows to to read more between the lines in the, in the meditations. Yeah, I heard a historian once say about George Washington that you the more you study the man, the more you like him. 
uh, or the more impressive he turns out to be. And I think that holds true for Marcus Aurelius. There, it's been rare that I've ever discovered something about Marcus that I didn't know, and I learned a lot from your first book, for instance. But uh, and then I, I've been I've been reading. Um, uh, Henry Sedgwick wrote this little biography of Marcus Aurelius that I'm reading right now, a sort yeah. of lost uh, or forgotten biography. Every time I read a new perspective on Marcus, I end up respecting or admiring him more. There really mm -hmm. hasn't been anything that I've come away with and gone, ugh, that was disappointing. Whereas Seneca is kind of the opposite. The more you study Seneca, the more complicated yeah. it gets. I, yeah, the more you study Seneca, the more you dig into Seneca, like the more the more problematic like he becomes Seneca. Here's like, I mean, honestly, um, in a sense, I mean, I guess this is a question of terminology. Normally, when we say sophist and we're talking about the class, classical antiquity, we're, we're really talking about Greek thinkers. But there were Latin orators and rhetoricians that are very similar to sophists, and so you can kind of talk about Latin sophists. So Fronto, for example, is, is a bit like a sophist. He's kind of a Latin sophist. Seneca is borderline Latin sophist. Like, in a sense, it's not really clear to what extent he actually lived. And also because we can't see him, right? Yeah. Like, sometimes you would you would know a philosopher if you walk past one in, in the street or, you you know, you kind of knew them personally. It was obvious that they were really living like a philosopher. But I think in, with Seneca, people probably got the opposite impression. You know, he had those hundreds of mahogany tables or whatever it was and, you know, these huge estates and things. And, you know, he was always hobnobbing with society and stuff. So I think the people that were around him probably thought, like, you know, you, there's a big gap between what you portray in your writings and what your life is actually like. And was, he, he, I really think Seneca, one of the things I take from his writings is that even if I try and sort of suspend judgment about what sort of person he was, like, it seems to me he's putting quite a lot of effort in his writings into constructing his public image. Sure. Um, and, like, and, like, he doesn't really say much about his um like in the letters to Lucilius, for example and his in his other writings you know you wouldn't really imagine that he was nero's right hand man like he put you know he doesn't he, he doesn't talk about that and he, he doesn't really give any hints about his opulent wealth or at least there's a lot of stuff that he leaves out in order to, con to construct a kind of different image of himself well, so so for for people who are listening who are not as familiar with the terms, is that kind of how you would distinguish between a sophist and a stoic, or a sophist and a philosopher? Sort of one is interested in theory and ideas and uh -huh. uh, beautiful language, and the other is about yeah. sort of the code of ethics and practices. And this is a really cool question, right? Like, how do you spot a sophist? Is like a really good question because. Socrates says in one of the Platonic dialogues, you guys sound just like philosophers sometimes. I think it's in Euthydemus, he says something like that. And uh, Epictetus, if I remember rightly, there's a passage where Epictetus says something along those lines as well. So sometimes a sophist could look just like a philosopher. For instance, Herodes Atticus used to quote Epictetus to people. Like, so he'd be he was really good at quoting Epictetus, apparently. Like, he knew, he knew the discourse really well. So he would sound like a sophist. But was he doing it because he really agreed with Epictetus or because he thought it was impressive, like, and it was, it was all show? Like, it would get a round of applause. It made him look intelligent. Like, the sophists used to compete um, giving speeches, um, kind of like on social media today, you know, the most popular posts gets the most engagement or most likes. The sophists would compete to get the biggest round of applause from their audience or to draw the biggest crowd. So they saw what they were doing as kind of like a game, a competition. It was all about appearances. It was all about image over substance, if you like. And uh, I think that's really the difference. And one of the differences that Socrates would have said as well is, you know, there's a, a, an aspect of Socratic irony that people don't mention that much but it's mentioned several times in Plato that Socrates used to pretend he had a bad memory, which is kind of weird, right? He'd be yeah. like, oh, listen, I've just got this terrible memory. And people are like, oh, Socrates, we know you don't have a bad memory. And the reason, supposedly, that he did it was that he didn't like the fact that sophists would talk for a long time without interruption. And he thought he needed to keep stopping them 
and just say, hang on a minute, that thing that you just said or that assumption that you just made, can we just go back a couple of steps and question that? Like, because if you, I'm kind of, I'm going to lose track if you keep going. Like, just let's just stop every couple of minutes and check. And they hated that because it kind of interrupted their flow. But, you know, it's really easy for someone to make an assumption that's false and then talk for an hour about it and yes. blind you with, you know, rhetoric. And that's kind of what he wanted to prevent them from doing. So sophists would talk a lot without necessarily allowing people to question the presuppositions that they were making. Back in the ancient world, philosophy wasn't abstract. It wasn't theoretical. It was designed to help you live the best life. In Stoicism 101, we have a two week course that will introduce you into philosophy that will make you a better person. There's interviews with me, daily lessons that will challenge you to be better, give you new ways of thinking, tackling the problems of life, becoming your best self. As Marcus Aurelius says, you could be good today, but instead you choose tomorrow. Epictetus says, how much longer are you gonna wait to demand the best for yourself? Check out our new course, Stoicism 101 at dailystoic.com slash 101. So that, that, that's something I imagine you can relate to. I certainly can too. I can explain a piece of Stoic philosophy. I can, I can get it perfectly done on the page. I can do it in an interview like this. I could do it on social media. I even can know what will the audience will respond to most, what will resonate the most, what people need to hear the most. But there is, of course, uh, the very big difference between then applying that in your personal life not because you don't agree with it or don't care about it, but because it's extraordinarily hard, right? So there's there's a certain, there's like multiple levels of hypocrisy, right? There could be the, the hypocrisy of like, hey, you shouldn't have premarital sex uh, or sex outside of marriage. Meanwhile, you're carrying on and having affairs. You're saying something that you just don't believe. You're trying uh -huh. to hold some, you're holding people to a standard for you know Christianity reasons or personal reasons or whatever, which you don't believe, that that's a level of hypocrisy, which maybe Seneca is at, maybe he's not. And then there's this sort of other level, which is, you know, maybe Marcus Aurelius is talking in meditations about, you know, life is too short to care about this or that, or this is why you can't lose your temper at so and so. And mm. then life is hard, right? Then mm. actually doing it is hard, even if you agree with it and can repeat it back perfectly. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so, I mean, I think we're kind of getting to the core of what the difference was between, like, these two characters, Nero, Marcus Aurelius. It's partly the people that were around them, I think, made a difference. Sure. And uh, maybe also their, their personality traits. But I think that, the, that Marcus didn't want to be fame, as far as we can tell. Like, I think also Marcus saw Hadrian in decline, and what I take away from, from reading the Roman histories that, that maybe isn't always emphasized is I really think Hadrian had a big impact on Marcus and, and it was a car crash. Like, and Marcus saw Hadrian kind of going crazy. Like, oh, I kind of imagine Hadrian a bit like, um, you know, Colonel Kurtz in Apocalypse Now or something like that. He built this huge estate like outside of Rome and kind of hold himself up there. Like he completely fell out with the Senate and was having these political purges and going crazy. And so Marcus saw like this collapse basically happening. Hadrian actually brought Marcus to come and live with him for like the last six months or so of his life. And Marcus, a teenager at the time, I think was scared and for several reasons. And, um, you know, he, he looked at that and thought, I don't want to end up like this guy. And that sh I think it really shook him. Like the historians say, that it shook him. And sometimes they exaggerate. There's, there's propaganda rhetoric, you know, that leads them to say he didn't really want to be emperor. We had to kind of drag him into it. But I think in Marcus's case, that's true. Like he, he thought um, the last emperor was a complete car crash and I don't want to end up like him. And then, you know, Marcus saw Antoninus Pius and he thought, this guy's the opposite. Like, so he went from this terrible, like negative role model, like that, that, that can really frighten him off to seeing someone doing the opposite and being everything that, that Hadrian wasn't. And by the way, Marcus says several times that no one could say of Antoninus that he was a sophist, which yeah. is interesting. Whereas actually, you know, talking of the sophist, Hadrian wanted, definitely wanted to be a sophist. 
like you know he kind of competed with them like and we, uh, wanted to be famous for his rhetorical skill it is really interesting because we know for a fact that Hadrian was an enormous influence on Marcus. They have a multi-year relationship. He picks him out as a kid, as you as you titled your new graphic novel. He gives him this nickname. Uh, so they're clearly an affection and a bond. And 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 Hadrian selects him, grooms him for power, and yet he appears almost nowhere in meditations. Yeah. There's like one or two sort of offhanded mentions, and it's really about how. Um, no one will remember anyone from yeah. uh, Hadrian's court, and so it's. It, I maybe what I could make up about that is he 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 had a love and an affection for Hadrian, but very much saw him as who he didn't want to be, and so his treatment of Antoninus is sort of, or sorry, of Hadrian is sort of a if you can't say anything nice, don't say yeah. anything at all, and so it's this a, a judgment by omission. Uh, that he he very much learned who to be from Antoninus and who yeah. not to be from Hadrian, which is unusual because most most of the hereditary kings would have only seen like their parent mm -hmm. ruling. Uh, yes, Marcus has the unusual experience of seeing two predecessors do yeah. their job before he comes along. Yeah, and he was a he was adopted by Hadrian. Was technically his adoptive grandfather. But he, I'd go a lot, even a little tiny bit further, and I'd say that I think in in the ancient world, and certainly in Latin literature, like the educated Romans were much more attuned to rhetoric than most of us are today. Sure. And they knew that if you heap praise on somebody, often, implicitly, what you're doing, without even mentioning their name, is trashing somebody else. So yes. in particular... If you say the new emperor is so intelligent and so merciful, that implies that the last emperor was stupid and cruel. Yeah. Right. And they totally heard that. So when Marcus heaps praise on Antoninus Pius and says nothing, which was a would be a profound insult, would, would be very serious like in Rome to completely like blank, you know, Hadrian. Um, people would read that and think, of course, the stuff he says about Antoninus Pius is implicitly a criticism. And some of it really stands out. Like that line about Ant no one could ever call Antoninus a sophist, it really sounds like it's an implicit criticism of, of Hadrian, as do some of the other things that he says. And you're right, they, he does mention Hadrian, I think, two or three other times, but it's only to use him as an example of somebody who used to be a big deal and is now pushing up daisies. Like, so being leveled by, by death. Well, you sort of, you meet people who are very successful or they have maybe what you think you want. And, or maybe you just see them on TV or maybe you're just reading about them in a Shakespeare play or whatever. And you go, oh, that's not success at all. I don't want to be this person. I think, is it Posidonius yeah. or Panatinus that, that sees uh, Marius at the end of his life and realizes like, oh, uh, this might have been the most successful general and consul that Rome has ever known, but this guy is a complete slave to power and ego. Yeah. And, and, and he really paints this sort of pathetic picture of a great man. And I think Marcus had a unique understanding of what a great emperor was and then whatever he didn't think a great emperor was, which was more Hadrian. But then there is this kind of... Uh, conflict of interest there because Hadrian was so good to Marcus and yeah. had set Marcus. So, so I think it was, it was, he, perhaps he just saw his, his adopted grandfather as this kind of tragic figure who he very much did not want to end up like. Yeah. But Ryan, the last teenage boy that Hadrian heaped favors on and was really, really good to wound That's up. That's true. Found drowned at the bottom of the Nile. Why like, that was Antinous. Like, and he was about the same age that Marcus, when Hadrian first discovered him, that, that Marcus was, like, when, when Hadrian came back from his mm. travels and, and, and he was, uh, they grew closer. So I think Mar Marcus, so we know there were many, many busts of Antinous, all, of course, all around Hadrian's villa. Marcus is brought there. He sees all these busts of this other teenage kid that was Hadrian. Imagine how weird that would have been. <laughs> Sure. To think, be surrounded yeah. by loads of images of hate this crazy despotic ruler's 
dead ex-teenage boyfriend and now he's decided he wants you to move in. Like, I think, so I think part of that also, it must have been, that must have made Marcus feel, to say the least, extremely awkward and self-conscious. Um, and he must have thought, am I going to end up drowned at the bottom of the Nile or something if I say something or do something that upsets Hadrian? Like, you know, it's, Hadrian turned Antinous into a god. He deified him. Um, and but you built this huge cult around him. So Hadrian's praising you isn't necessarily a good thing. It could be quite scary sometimes. Uh, there's strings. Be, there's strings, <laughs> strings attached, attached to the favor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. It is weird. I haven't seen that much speculation, considering it'd be kind of such an obvious insinuation. There isn't that much speculation about a relationship between Marcus Aurelius and Hadrian. Yeah, I, there's nothing about that as far as I, I'm aware, but loads, obviously, with, with Antinous. But then Marcus is in, is the other kid that Hadrian's been, you know, like, um, we're told that there's this weird phrase that kind of bugs me a bit in the Historia Augusta that says Marcus was brought up, the, and the term it uses in, in Latin literally means in the bosom of Hadrian. Like he was reared in the bosom of Hadrian, or sometimes it translated in Hadrian's lap, which obviously sounds kind of creepy, right? Yes. Like, and it, it must have been, although this isn't really emphasized in the histories, they kind of go from emphasizing how Hadrian was this, like, a, you know, predatory, um, older, my pederast, basically, to then kind of dropping that when it comes to talking about Marcus. Yeah, although, why do you think that is? I don't know. Maybe they just didn't want to tarnish Marcus's like name in any way by any kind of sexual innuendo. But they made a lot. There was a lot of sexual innu- innuendo about Hadrian and other teenage boys, not just Antinous. You know, so obviously, you know, Marcus is in a like, in an awkward uh, environment there. And uh, and then he says in the meditations again, really cryptically, something about um, Antoninus Pius doing away with pederasty like and he kind of praises him for that and he, he says he praises Anton, uh, Antoninus for um bringing an end to pederasty it's not really clear what he means by that but again it, it does sound a bit like a contrast with Hadrian like you definitely couldn't have said that of Hadrian sure. like you know it sounds like he you know an implicit uh some kind of implicit contrast that he might be making there again I find I find Marcus Aurelius and Antoninus's relationship so fascinating because okay so so for people who don't understand or don't know this hadrian uh sees something in marcus sets it believes he can be emperor but but marcus is only like 16 or 17 years old at the time right um and uh so it's too he he, he's smart he's hadrian understands power intimately enough to know that's how you make a Nero, right? You do not give a 17-year-old boy uh, unlimited power. So mm-hmm. there needs to be a, not not even a regent, but there needs to be someone else to groom Marcus for success. And so he picks Antoninus. He Maybe he thinks Antoninus will live for 10 more years or five years, and he, he lives for almost 20. But this weird you know, ca- chain of succession that Hadrian yeah. sets up, Antoninus, as soon as he becomes emperor could have done whatever he wanted right mm-hmm. and that that antoninus goes even though he a- antoninus had actually earned the job antoninus is the most yeah. successful uh roman politician at that time is is powerful is is well respected has built this reputation you know he earned it and then yeah. he's being told you're a placeholder for this kid yeah. uh in every other historical instance of anything like that you know very quickly after. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's very weird. And actually, I don't, I, I've thought about this a lot because I also wrote, I've written three books about Marcus in a row now. I wrote a prose biography of Marcus for, for Yale University Press where I had to really dig in to the, the details uh, a lot more. But I still can't really understand exactly what was going on with the succession plans. I mean, it may be that they were just a little bit chaotic because Hadrian, first of all, picks... Uh, Lucius Aelius, who's um, Lucius Verus's father, right? Like, and then he, he, everybody thought he was a terrible choice because he had no accomplishments to his name. 
and he died prematurely. Like he was a very sickly man. And then Antoninus has nothing in common with this dude. So it, it, there's no real logic to it. The only thing I can think is maybe that Hadrian's succession plans were in such a mess at this point, and he was becoming sort of ill and paranoid and withdrawn and stuff, that possibly the Senate kind of pressured him into uh, like a choosing Antoninus. So they maybe thought, okay, you've had your, you chose this other crazy guy, like that's just one of your entourage or like another kind of hanger on, like that's a nobody. Like, and that ended really badly. Like, so will you please just let us now have the guy that we want? Like, it kind of feels a little bit like that to me because he, he sure. seems to have gone from, you know, to, to, to pick a completely different type of character in Antoninus. And it was, a, you know, a good choice, surprisingly good choice. Another little bit of trivia, like just kind of harking back to that thing about being brought up in the bosom of Hadrian. Something I didn't fully realise until I kind of started to to write more and more about this is Hadrian had, uh, some of the Roman emperors had a network of spies that they, they used quite extensively. And they also had this practice of paying informers like that seems quite central to a lot of what happened. Hadrian used that pretty extensively. We're, we're told about it a number of times. You know, he'd open people's letters like he'd have spies put in people's households. And of course, all the these people that he thought were conspiring to seize the throne from him, you can bet that he was opening the mail and had spies in their households. So sure. the freedmen and the slaves in their households we, we are really easy to recruit as informers. Like these are people who have sure. very little. If you say, listen, if you tell me everything that you hear, then I'll, I'll set you free and I'll give you a lot of money and you know, sure. you know from the emperor, that, that's extremely persuasive. So I think, imagine knowing that and then being told you have to move into Hadrian's villa where <laughs> everybody around you works for him. Sure. Like, and so anything you say like, is potentially going to, you know is going to be reported back to Hadrian. So I think Marcus must have thought, I have to be extremely careful what I say out loud and, and who I confide in. Like, even when he was in his mother's house, but certainly once he moved into Hadrian's house. And then uh, supposedly Antoninus and Marcus did away with that. So that was, I think, you know, it's not spoken about much, but one of the other big changes, big transitions would be that they stopped spying on people, allegedly. Well, and I think this probably is, that's probably also a credit then to Antoninus and, and Marcus Aurelius that, that they managed to pass the, the test given all the spying yeah. and informants that were going on. And isn't there a story that one of the reasons that Hadrian picks Antoninus is that he sees Antoninus helping his elderly father-in-law up a set of yeah. stairs, that there is this sort of inherent goodness in Antoninus that was relatively uh, rare at that time or is rare in politics even to this day. And, and perhaps that goes to you know, whatever that goodness that he sees in Marcus that gets him to nickname him Verismus, and then the goodness that he sees in Antoninus, exception that proves the rule, it works out with both of them. They were both inherently good and decent people, despite a lot of temptations and a lot of reasons not to be. I think so. In fact, I think we can go a bit further. So incidentally, there's another passage in the meditations that once you know this stuff about history. Again, often these little bits of history suddenly give added meaning to some of the things that Marcus yeah. says. So one of them is, then you notice, he says, never say anything, well, never say or do anything that requires walls or curtains, he says in the meditations. You think, yeah, like, of course, because, like, literally you couldn't. Like, you know, you had to assume that, like, you know, everything that you did was in public view and was being reported back to the emperor. So that must have had a special meaning for him. But, you know, the other thing that strikes me is we don't know why Hadrian calls Marcus Verismus. It's a really weird omission. So they, it, this is kind of emphasised in the histories, and it's obviously quite important. Um, it's in Cassius Dio, it's in the Historia Augusta, but also we know that this seems to have been public knowledge because Justin Martyr, in his apology, addresses Marcus as Verissimus, the philosopher, oh, in wow. adulthood, right? So everyone knew, even in a, a kind of semi-official letter, he's using this title. So it must have become a sort of cognomen, like, 
And he also, it's interesting, he associates, he seems to associate it with him being a philosopher, which makes it even more intriguing. So what was it that earned him this title? There's a story there that's kind of like missing. And it's kind of annoying because it obviously sounds like another really famous story, which is the context that we're told that is it, it, is, it follows on from being told that Hadrian persecuted um, sophists and other intellectuals that disagreed with him. So he would exile them or destroy their careers. And there's a, a, a famous sophist called Favrinus of Aralata who supposedly joked that um, Hadrian had used a word incorrectly and, and the, the sophists were kind of obsessed with how to use individual words correctly and stuff, etymology and stuff like that. So he used a word incorrectly. And Favorinus's followers said, how come you didn't just tell him that you got that wrong? And Favorinus said, well, you know, you, you, you can forgive me for not wanting to point out the errors of a man that commands 30 legions. In other words, he, he's an intellectual coward, right? Like, he's, I'm scared. Like, truth, tell me got it truth wrong. Truth to power is a risky proposition. It's like Hans Christian Andersen's fable of the emperor's new clothes, right? So yeah. everyone's scared to tell this guy that he's walking about naked, like he's talking, he's, he's using words wrong and stuff like that. Except the, then there's this little kid. Uh, actually, we don't know how old he was, but I, my best guess is it's kind of implied that it was before he reached six. Like in the history of Augusta, I think, from the context. So it's kind of implied that he did this when he was small. It sounds like Marcus said or did something that maybe everyone else at court was. And it, it, we don't know, but it, the, you know, all the kind of circumstantial clues sort of indicate it's like the emperor's new clothes. And everyone was like, wow, that kid is the only person that could tell Hadrian something he didn't want to hear. And then, you know, maybe weirdly, this guy that was spying on everybody and persecuting anyone that would speak out against him took a shine to Marcus because he thought, this kid is the only one that's got the nerve to tell me when I've made a mistake or something like that, perhaps. Right. I wish we knew what it was that he said to him. No, that that's uh, that's lovely. And, and in meditations, he does, you know, he says, like, if it's not true, don't say it. Yeah. You know, if it's not true, don't think it. It, it did seem to put a lot of uh, emphasis on just speaking the truth, doing yeah. the right thing, even if it made you unpopular, even if it was risky. Uh, and maybe that's a lifelong habit. I, also, this is a, little, a bit of trivia as well, but uh, Herodian says that Marcus had another son called Marcus Annius Verus. So he named this other son after himself. That was Marcus's birth name that ran in his family. And he appointed him Caesar alongside Commodus. He was like a year or two younger than Commodus. But this kid died when he was about five years old. And Herodian says that Marcus also nicknamed this kid Verissimus. Mm. Like, so he handed down the nickname and he, he gave it to what seems like possibly his favorite son. Maybe this kid, even though he, he only lived to be about five, perhaps also said something very blunt and frank and honest. And Marcus looked at him and thought, he's, he's got, you know, this frankness, the paresia, like of the freedom of speech, of the, the, the philosophers cherished so much, perhaps. It is, it is remarkable, like when you think, you go, oh, how hard it would be to be a Stoic when you're an emperor, right? And it yeah. would be. But you think about, you just describe a situation where a person loses six children before mm -hmm. adulthood and you try not just to think, was that person able to be stoic, but like, could that person get out of bed in the morning? Right. Like yeah. that is, that is like a horror story of horror stories. It's, it's, it's yeah. as close to incomprehensible as I have found in the study of people. Like there, there's always things you're like, wow, I did, that's hard to wrap my head around. But the idea that Marcus loses not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but six children, it, uh -huh. it's, it's impossible to even conceive what that, even when people say things like, oh, that was much more common back then. I mean, it yeah. wasn't common like that. It's like, I'd say yes and no to people who say it was, it's, tr it's certainly true that infant mortality was common, death in childhood was common, and some people were, were kind of numb to it. But there's also examples of people being absolutely distraught. Actually, Fronto, in one of his letters to Marcus, talks about how he lost a, a, a grandson that was very small, and, and he's virtually suicidal, like he's completely beside himself over the, the loss of his grandson. 
So it, it's certainly not true. And, and also, sometimes people think that Roman nobles could be quite... So we tend to make generalizations about figures in yeah. history, right? So it's true that a lot of Roman fathers were had little contact with their children um, until they, they reached like adulthood, about 15 years old in, in Roman society. Um, however, Marcus in his letters shows that he was a real family man, and it sounds like he spent a lot of time with his young children. Like he talks to Fronto about them, and he seems to take real joy like in watching them play and things like that. Um, so that you know, even if other Romans were like that, Marcus wasn't like that, and he's an, he's an incredibly affectionate and warm individual in his letters to his friends as well. Um, so he, he certainly he would have been devastated. We're told that he was absolutely devastated when he lost one of his tutors, yeah, like right. one of his teachers. So uh, of course he would have been devastated at the the loss of his children. Um, and you know, you, something else you said was that it was kind of like a horror show. When I was working on the graphic novel, one of the things that kind of emerged for me when we we, we kind of put it on the page and we tried to, to visualize Marcus's life, I it dawned on me one day that it a lot of it was. I thought this is a horror story. I didn't realize. Like I'm actually, I didn't dawn on me uh, until we were trying to visualize it. And I thought this this is like we're writing a, a horror story in places. The warfare, the carnage, the the Antonine plague. We talk. What happens in prose history is that you'll say there was a plague, and then there was a war. And then there was another war, and then there was like a civil war. It all happened at the on. same time. It happened at the same time. Yeah, yeah. like the plague is ongoing, like for the rest <laughs> of his life. Like right. there's people with going blind and with sores on their faces, and you know, like horrible outbreaks and stuff. Devastating. It was very visible as well. Like, um, so Marcus's life, I think, from that point onwards, from the point of the plague onwards, became. I think Rome must have become. And all, the, the indications in the histories are that Rome became a darker and kind of more desperate place. We're, to, we're told, incidentally, about religious fanatics appearing and exploiting the gullible during the, the plague and stuff like that happening. There was a civil war, like, during the plague. Like, so there was, I think, social unrest and a kind of breakdown of the, the cohesion of society to some extent. It was tense. Things got, things got kind of tense. Yeah, I wonder the, what that's like—a plague, civil yeah. unrest. Uh, if only, <laughs> if only there was some way we could relate to that experience. Well, you know, it, your point about how the more you understand about Marcus's life, and this is what I was trying to do in *Lives of the Stoics*. I think you do this well in the graphic novel. You do it extremely well in *How to Think About uh, How to Think Like a Roman Empire*. Uh, Roman Emperor is is that when you when you understand the history, you realize a lot of these, as you said, a lot of these lines and meditations. You understand that it's not just this throwaway observation. There's a there's a life experience behind it. So there's one yeah. pat there's one part, and I talked to Robin Waterfield about this. There, I forget which book it is. It's later in Meditations, but there's like two back to back entries where Marcus is clearly talking about having. He he talks about you know wanting children in old age. You reach for your children and they're not there anymore. You know mm -hmm. he's he he talks about. Basically, what it's like to 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 care about someone and lose someone, and then they're gone. He's mm -hmm. he's not. This isn't just some abstract philosophical uh, observation. He could be talking about the son that was named after him, or his favorite daughter, yeah. or like these are real things that he's talking about that would have been excruciatingly painful and tragic and awful that really happened to him as a human being. Let's let's talk about that the style of the meditations a little bit because that, that's something that really intrigues me. Like I know one of the first things I noticed about the meditations is there's something there's a couple of strange things about the way that it's written. So it's artfully vague in a sense. There are places where he mentions names of individuals, hmm. particularly in book one, but elsewhere sometimes he'll name people and we don't we've no idea who he's talking about, like figures that are forgotten in history. Um, and he'll mention some specific events, but generally it's really vague. So, like, probably one of the most famous passages in the meditations is the right at the start of book two, where he says, every morning when you wake up, tell yourself yes. you're going to meet troublesome, treacherous, and meddling people, and blah, blah, blah. Who are these people? Like, you know, it's, it's odd in a way that he doesn't give any kind of indication throughout. Sure. I think there's a kind of technical reason why he does that. And it, it's also really cool how we know about it. So 
scholars, when they discovered in the 19th century, we, we also have this cache of letters from Fronto to Marcus and also between Fronto and a few other people that they knew. And uh, Fronto was Marcus's Latin rhetoric tutor, right? So scholars were a bit disappointed because Fronto was meant to be second only to Cicero, the greatest orator in Roman history. And they thought, well, in, in these letters, he doesn't really seem that impressive. <laughs> And it, there's not that much philosophy. There's very little philosophy really in them. He, he's mainly kind of talking about family, c- complaining about his gout, um, and talking about, about sleep Marcus's, a lot, being sick. Sleep. Yeah, and there are, like, Marcus's homework that he was he was kind of setting him as well. Like you know, you've got to write an essay about such and such. Um, but there's a really cool thing. Like at one point, fr- there's this kind of battle between Marcus. Uh, being taught Stoic philosophy and being taught rhetoric between the Stoics and the Sophists. And whether Junius Rusticus or Marcus Cornelius Fronto is going to be his main tutor, it seems like there's a kind of like um, yeah. a, a, a tension, a conflict there. There obviously is. And so Fronto will repeatedly try and persuade Marcus that he needs to study rhetoric, even if he wants to be a philosopher. And he says at one point, I think he returns this a couple of times, actually, that philosophers tend to come up with paradoxes. Like, so because they're thinking really deeply, they'll say things that have never been said before. Like, they're they're struggling to find the words. And he says, so, of course, these ideas that they have are kind of obscure, and you need rhetoric to be able to articulate them clearly for your own benefit and other people's. And he says to Marcus, as a homework assignment, what you should do is take these sayings and turn them over repeatedly in your mind and paraphrase them, like say them several different ways. Now, scholars immediately went, well, hang on a minute. That kind of looks like what the meditations is. Sure. Like he's taken these wisdom say, you know, because it's quite repetitive, right? Why is he saying the same thing over and over again in different words? Like, because he's been set this as a, an intellectual exercise, like decades earlier by Fronto. But it may also explain why it seems weirdly abstract, because I guess if you took a philosophical insight about a specific situation, and then you think, I'm going to keep paraphrasing that and trying to find different words, I think it starts to lose its specificity, if you know what I mean, sure, right? Sure, sure. Like, no, and, I think and that's, really- actually, that's actually Epictetus's advice, which I have on the back of the journal. He says, every day and night, keep thoughts like these at hand, write them, read them aloud, talk to yeah. yourself and others about them. That's what the philosophy is. It's the, it's It's like meditations is the byproduct of yeah. the physic of the philosophy as opposed to the articulation of the philosophy it'd be like if you could if you could somehow see a transcript of a zen buddhist meditation practice that's mm-hmm. what you'd be seeing but actually the transcript is irrelevant the pro- it was the doing it that was important so because i think because it's kind of he leaves it sort of abstract and maybe because He's, re- he's saying the th- same things over and over again. It becomes a, a little bit more vague. Um, the names kind of drop, specific names drop out and stuff. I think that's partly why the meditations became so popular. Because when he says, imagine every morning that you're going to meet troublesome people and meddling people and so on, we think that sounds like that guy that works at the desk across from me. Yeah. Or that sounds like my mother-in-law. Or oh, that sounds like one of my friends, right? So we project us. He leaves us enough space yes. to project ourselves into his shoes. So the positive side of that is it's easy for people to see themselves uh, in the words and to adapt them to their own modern situation. The downside of it, I think, is that it does at times become a, a little bit abstract. And if you start to up- combine it with a history and imagine that he's talking about real people and real situations, Um, I think in some ways that allows us to picture, to put more of a human face on Stoic philosophy and see what Marcus is saying is more of a kind of livable philosophy of life. Um, So there's pros and cons, I think, to the abstract way that he tends to articulate himself in the meditations. The the example of that that hit me the hardest, and we might have talked about this when we talked, I guess this would have been in 2020, but there's a, a line in meditations where Marx Aurelius talks about how there's two types of plagues. There's the one mm-hmm. that can destroy your life and the one that can destroy your character, right? Yeah. When I read that in 2007, uh-huh. you know, 
it was very different than when I reread it for however many of the time in uh-huh. March of 2020. You go, oh, I see what you're talking about now uh-huh. because now I've experienced yeah. a plague and I've seen what a plague does to people's character. And you yeah. realize Marcus is talking about the kinds of things that you're seeing around you all the time and the way that external events and stresses can reveal what's what's fundamentally flawed or vulnerable in a person. I would put the time scale slightly differently. Actually, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, when people talked about that quote, they thought it seems a bit harsh. Like it seems he's being a little bit dismissive of the play. But then as the pan- our pandemic went on, I think more people yes. are like, no, he's got a point. Like, yeah. you know, the, I mean, the pandemic was bad, but like the impact on society, like psychologically, like and like uh, politically is, is even worse. Like, yeah. in some ways. So, he, yeah, I can see where he's coming from, for sure. But that's also strangely abstract as well, isn't it? It's the only time that he really explicitly mentions the plague. And, and what he says about it is strangely kind of philosophical, but, like, so abstract, you know. Um, yeah, it's like 20... That, that occupies 20 years of his life, yeah. and, or whatever, 15 years of his life. And it gets one... And the only mention yeah. is is that it can affect some people's character negatively. That seems like a weird summary of a momentously historical, and and not just historical, but to him, it would have been a day-to-day event, right? In the yeah. way that he would have woken oh. up every day and news of the plague or yeah. things inspired by or, or changed by the plague would have been shaping what he was doing. And that's the only instance of it. On a huge, yeah. Like, I mean, it sh- shifted the, like, the, the fate of the war really explicitly. I mean, to the extent that I think the the Praetorian Guard had an outbreak of the, the plague and so it's kind of like his personal like, uh, sure. bodyguard or personal legion almost. Um, and but they lost one of the Praetorian Guards at that time. And a lot of historians think it's it, it's possible that he was taken by the plague as well. So he would have been a friend of Marcus. Like he would yeah. have been one of his, his closest associates and, and one of his most senior generals. So, like, you're not only is he seeing this everywhere, but it's causing total chaos in terms of the the hierarchy of Roman society. Now he's got to find people to fill these roles, and now he's got to figure out, you know, how to fight battles when some of these legions are, you know, dying of the the plague. It could also be, you know, the um, the uprising in Egypt that uh, where the, these tribesmen called the Bacoli, um were able to defeat the Egyptian legion. And then Avidius Cassius, Marcus's sure. most senior general in the East, had to be sent and given emergency powers to put down this uprising. That may be because the Egyptian legion had the plague at the time, perhaps, and they, they may have been under strength. And therefore, the Bacol line might have thought, this is our opportunity. You guys are all dying of the plague in there. Why, you know, and they, they saw a chance and took it. It seems like it's not a coincidence that the Romans had all these uprisings and the big Marcomanni invasion, invasion at that time. They were weakened. Because, uh, they were seriously weakened, yeah. I had something else I wanted to run by you because I've been thinking about it a lot recently. I was reading uh, Hierocles or Heracles. How do you pronounce it? I think it's Hierocles. But... Oh, yeah. I was reading Hierocles and, and the translator was making this note that when the Stoics started, they started with a kind of, they were very much descended from the Cynics. Right there's this sort of rejection of uh, you know earthly things. Uh, there was kind of this uh, it's hyper individualistic. You know, mm-hmm. like get what's your you know focus on your own self improvement. Forget everything else. And uh, and and that as Stoicism evolves, she's sort of noting that it softens. Right, yeah. that it softens into the notion of justice. Even though Zeno talks about courage, temperance, justice, wisdom, she's mm-hmm. saying that the the, sto- the the justice was was undervalued as a virtue. But by the time it gets to Marcus Aurelius, this idea of being community minded, of participating, of yeah. of trying, of of giving a shit about other people, this becomes. Yeah the primary Stoic virtue, which Marcus really says, you know, a number of times in meditations. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that evolution? Uh, yeah, what do you think about that evolution? Then I have another follow-up to that. I think it's true. Like, um, I mean, it, it may be in some ways they just conceptualized justice and social responsibility a little bit differently in, in classical Greece than they did in Roman society. But for sure, 
The cynics were less concerned with our social bonds and responsibility, and they do seem a bit harsh at times. And the Stoics definitely, but Marcus Aurelius puts so much emphasis on justice. He actually literally says at one point that it's the most important virtue. He mentions justice or uh, natural affection or cosmopolitanism or something, something along those lines. That's something that has to do with our interpersonal relationships and our relationship with society and almost every page of the meditations like it's the main theme really of the the book um but the, that's not so much and obviously in diogenes the cynic if he is concerned about uh society it, it's in a more rudimentary way yeah and and i i've just been interested in that evolution now because it does seem that there is a hyper individualistic uh, I, I don't want to say right wing because it puts too much of a modern political and but there does seem to be a misunderstanding today of stoicism yeah. that skips out on the inconvenience of having to care about other people. And, and, yeah. and perhaps the confusion is in the dichotomy of control, we don't really control other people. So maybe people are confused as to why they're supposed to care about their well-being but Marcus Aurelius doesn't seem to have any confusion in this regard. I think so. I mean, like, I think it's also linguistically because we use the word stoic. Like all of these terms for Greek philosophy, their meanings became caricatured over the centuries, right? Sure. So what we mean by Epicurean today, um, you know, generally is just somebody that enjoys, you know, fancy food and fine dining and stuff like that, right? Yeah, and what we mean by cynic with a small c is just somebody that kind of sneers at things and sure. you know has a negative attitude towards other people and you know, sophist, skeptic, like these other words, academic, have all kind of become a little bit simplified or caricatured in their meaning over time. So stoic comes to mean just being like a robot or you know being unemotional, like, and that's actually how we use the term in psychology as a research construct. Like uh, in research on lowercase stoicism consistently shows that it's problematic, it's toxic. It, it leads to um, increased psychological or emotional vulnerability. Like, so, you know, we, we often have to explain to psychologists that what we mean by stoic philosophy is much more nuanced and complex like than just kind of suppressing your feelings like it's it's like when people hear the word sexy, it doesn't have anything yeah. to do with sex anymore. It means beautiful or attractive uh-huh. or well designed or sleek or awesome. You know, it it's it when when you hear stoic, ninety nine percent of the time it's not remotely connected to stoic philosophy. And and that confuse like even people that re- weirdly even people that read Marcus Aurelius or, or other books in stoicism still kind of are viewing it through that lens in many cases. And so I've met people who read the meditations and I talk to them about this and they say that they hadn't even noticed that Marcus is talking about justice and society yes. and natural affection. And I think, how is it possible? Like, it's kind of the May, it goes on and on and on about it. It reminds me of this quote from William Blake that says, you, we both read the Bible day and night, but you read black where I read white. I can't think, how could you have not noticed all of the references, you know, to not being alienated from your fellow man and, you know, having love? He, at one point at the beginning, Marcus says that um, he's describing the I, the ideal Stoic. He's talking about um, Sextus of Chironea, like Plutarch's nephew, who was one of his, his Stoic teachers. And he describes him as being free from passions. And he, he mentions anger, like... So free from passions such as anger, and yet full of false orga, full of love. Yeah, so it's one of my favorite it, passages. Full of love, like yes. kind of brotherly love. He's talking about false orga, basic is is what we translate as natural affection, but it means the the love of a parent for the the children. It's kind of like paternal love, or we might say platonic love or brotherly love. He thinks that's the the pinnacle um, of stoicism, and then you know, and yet people think have this kind of atomistic, individualistic view of it that's just about, it's almost more like nihilism, the way that people interpret Stoicism in many cases. And I really think if Marcus Aurelius was around, he would think this is more or less the opposite of of 
what I thought the, the, the human ideal was. You guys are completely alienated like from other people around you and the, the rest of society. And Stoics want to reverse that. They want us, in a sense, I think Stoic virtue, particularly in Zeno and in the early Greek Stoics, it, it's tied up with their pantheism. And I think one of their starting points is this idea that they want us to be more at one with the rest of the universe. They want us to realize our, our oneness with the cosmos as a whole um, and with uh, with our fellow men, like with, with other human beings. Um, it's extraordinary, by the way, just as a slight aside to that, Marcus mentions Rome being a Roman citizen a couple of times in the meditations. Um, but other than that, he's when he talks about overcoming anger, feeling love, overcoming alienation, he's talking about people in general, not just Roman subjects or citizens. And the people that he's dealing with as he's writing that are often um, what the Romans would have called barbarian envoys. Like, you know, it's strange to think that, it, it, again, we, we lose sight of that unless we imagine him writing the meditations sure. in the evening after he's had a meeting with a bunch of foreign envoys in the in the morning. And, and also he'd been surrounded by uh, foreigners, all the auxiliary Units would have been uh, Germanic tribesmen and people from other parts of the empire. Well, so and the, he's not just talking about his fellow uh, well-educated, rich Roman senators yeah. who went to the same schools and had the same under. Like he's he's not talking about our brotherly connection as he spent time with a couple hundred people exactly like him in a beautiful marble palace. It's in, it's in the mud of a quincum, right? Like it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's far away and he, he's surrounded by salt of the earth, regular ass people. He says um, at one point, actually in, in meditations two part one, he says, he says, I'm not talking about uh, a bond of seed, i.e. like family, or yeah. blood, i.e. race, he specifically says. Like, and it's odd that he would say that because it really highlights the fact that he's talking about brotherly love towards the people he's at war with. Yeah. Which is, a, you know, I, just, I think it becomes highlighted more if we really try and visualize the historical context in which he's, he's writing this. If we are to yeah. believe um, Lucian, the market and uh, the, the chronology of this annoyingly is, is there's some debate among scholars. But it, one interpretation is that 20,000 Roman soldiers were killed in a single day at the beginning of the Marcomannic War at Carnuntum, where Marcus then stations himself, right? That would have been one of the biggest defeats in Roman military history. And then Marcus goes there and stations, which must have you know, been incredibly risky. Like, so knowing that he's in this place where loads of Romans have been slaughtered by the Germanic tribesmen, he's telling himself, nevertheless... I have to view these people as my brothers and sisters. Yeah, it's uh, he's being tested at the the realist level because the preservation of the empire is at stake, public opinion is at stake. He's just witnessed a horrible atrocity, and he's trying to go back to his philosophical first principles and go, not what do I emotionally think in this moment, not what is politically. Uh, convenient to think in this moment, uh, not what will rile the troops up in this moment, but like what at my bedrock values as a human being do I want to believe in this moment? And that really reminds me of something that I wanted to, to mention, actually. And we kind of came close to earlier when we were talking about how often he'd been bereaved and lost all of those children, but also many other friends and family members that he'd lost. Um, it only, as I was working on the graphic novel and again, like trying to really visualize Marcus's life, did it really dawn on me? I just, I remember just kind of sitting up one day and thinking it really hit me for the first time suddenly that Marcus Aurelius during the plague, surrounded by people who at one point increasingly were probably plotting to assassinate him. Um, the Also many people, assumed that Marcus Aurelius was going to die um, because he looked very frail. Yeah. Um, stationing himself at the frontier where he, he was risking his life. Uh, all of these things combined, when I really just started to picture it, I, I suddenly realized he really must have woken up each morning and kind of pinched himself 
and thought, am I actually still alive? He was living I mean, on borrowed time. He really must have felt that, and, and even beyond the, like, the, all the, like, I get the impression that all these people around him were gossiping about, they thought he's not going to last much longer. And he had that going on for at least a decade, I think. Like, people speculating about his Im- impending death. What must it be like to kind of know that that's the gossip and that some people in the wings are just waiting for you to die? Like, he's constantly, like, his sense of his own mortality, I, I really think must have been much more uh, pervasive and intense than it, it would be for, for most of us. You know, well, that was my favorite. That was my favorite passage in in your book, "How to Think Like a Roman Emperor." You talked about how one of the rudimentary uh, attempts to ward off the plague was they would burn incense, right? Yeah. Which was also masking the horrendous stench of dead bodies, yeah. and how Marcus would have woken up every day and smelled that. All the Romans would. It would have been literally in the air, just in the way that the virus is in the air. So yeah. too is the reality of your looming inevitable death. And even, I, we can't be 100% for sure, because actually one of the curiosities about Galen's account is he doesn't mention, from what I remember, um, pockmarks or scarring on the skin. I could be wrong about that. That's my recollection. That seems a little bit odd. But if it was smallpox, which it's believed um, there's, there's probably a variant of, of smallpox, then you know, we would expect people to have had pock marks on their faces. So, for, you know, for the next 15 years or so, Marcus would have been surrounded by, in people's faces. And Stars. some people would yeah. also have lost their vision. Um, you know, they would get kind of cataracts from the effect that the plague would spread onto the, the surface of their eyes. They would maybe even have lost uh, fingers or, or been crippled. By it. So they would be very visible, potentially, and the, the, you say the incense hanging there would have been a constant reminder as well. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up because Memento Mori is, I think, the, the most beautiful, life-changing and probably uh, perennial theme in meditation. Just over and over again, he's reminding himself life is very short. He says you could leave life right now. Let that determine what you do and say and think. And if Marcus Aurelius needed to remind himself of that, in the midst of the Antonine Plague, yeah. when you really could drop dead like that, uh, the idea that we wouldn't need to in our much softer, more protected bubble of a world, we need that reminder much more so. And I think in the meditations, we're benefiting from the fact that Marx Aurelius faced so much danger. Yes. Like, so we get his, his wisdom is very deep in this regard because he spent decades really, you know, very, in a very immediate way, contemplating his own mortality. And then we get to read about what he made of that philosophically. Beautiful. Well, I love the books and I always love talking to you and uh, I hope to see you again one of these days. Yeah, likewise. It's been a pleasure as always, Ryan. Thanks very much.